We all have different styles. We all have different things we like to read, right? So be true to yourself. Always learn, always grow, but be true to yourself too. Any other comments? Um, thank you, Cameron. You're welcome. Uh, Roxy. Um, yeah, give me one sec to flip to my next screen so I could read it. Okay. Um, her first memory came a week later as she woke from her coma in a morphine haze. Water, she whispered as urgently as she could. Her voice was small and weak, was barely audible through the hum of machines. She, she shifted in a tangle of tubes and wires as she did her best to get the attention of the nurse. Water, she whispered again desperately. Marisol had never been so thirsty. She wanted to soothe her throat and summon her words. She knew where she was, but not how she got there. The memories of the few days before her accident were like an old puzzle with several missing pieces. Nice. Very nice. Thank you. So let me ask for comments. Sometimes if I comment first, other people are hesitant to comment. Okay. Hi. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say that I really liked the ending on that. Um, the one about the memories of the few days before her accident were like old puzzle, like an old puzzle with several missing pieces. I really, really love that part. Mm -hmm. um, that is a really good visual for how she's feeling and everything. It's a metaphor. It's a great metaphor. And that's another thing metaphors do. They give you a visual either in, in any of the senses. A visual can be for any of the senses. And especially when it's something we relate to. Okay. Um, so I like the memories of the few days before accident were like an old puzzle with several missing pieces. So I think we see, we, we understand now she's been in an accident. She's here. And I, I'm starting to feel concerned for this person. Tension's starting to build because she had an accident. Well, the question is, what kind of accident? What happened? What condition is she in? So we want, we want the conditions, the questions to develop. We want the questions to be asked in our mind so that we're concerned about her and and want to know more about what's going to happen to this person. So there should always be, the tension should always give us a promise that there's going to be more we're going to find out about this story. Can I make a comment? Yeah. Oh, um, I really like her struggle, her physical struggle to speak and her terrible thirst because it's very real and also we don't know yet is it just because she's been in a coma or is that part of the damage of whatever the event was good very good does this do you feel tension in this or it does it feel like there is something missing you're not quite getting to start feeling tension in this situation I don't, I don't find that there's anything missing. Good. Um, let's say another question is, does she have any family or friends there with her? Good, Jacqueline, that's a good question. And that can, that's part of like the reveal. And if we find out she looks around and there's no one there or someone she expected to be there isn't, that would certainly add to the tension. Why aren't they there? 
Or if everyone's there, why is it that everyone's here? What does this mean? Okay. Thank you very much, Roxy. Good job. Um, right, Anna, sir, if she didn't want what was there. Yes, she didn't want whoever was there to be there. Then we're wondering, wait a minute, was that person involved in her accident? Is she fearful of them? So were there any others that anyone wanted to share? Yes, I would. Oh, I don't know if you're listening to me. I see there's a note on there. Did oh, uh, Okay. <laughs> I was wondering about the, uh, I wrote the paragraph and I was wondering about your evaluation. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yes. No, I mean, yeah, I was asking if there was another paragraph. So, okay. Okay. Mine, okay. I have to, I'm in the dark here. Emma knew there was no good time to tell him, but she approached, as she approached the library door and heard him speaking, her heart leapt and she knew that now was not the time. Okay, read it to me again. Emma knew there was um, not a good time to tell him, but as she approached the library door and heard his voice, her heart leapt and she knew now was not the time. Okay. Okay, that's the beginning of a, of a, of a moment of tension. She's torn between wanting to tell him, but now... She heard his voice, so he's talking to somebody else, see, so it's not a good time, yeah. Yeah, okay, that wasn't clear to me that he was talking to somebody else, because he might have been talking to her. He might have been saying- Oh, no, because she was sneaking up on him. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> At least that was what was in my mind, yeah. Okay, so you, so, so, yeah, make sure that those things come through. I may have missed him, and they may have been there. Well, I, I just I just said as she approached the door, she heard his voice. So okay. I, 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 he wasn't, she wasn't there yet. Yeah. Okay. No, good. Good job. I'm just going to say that. So like the word approach, if you used a word like, you know, as she. Um, snuck up on him. <laughs> no, I mean, you don't want to say snack up, on it, but there's yeah. lots of words that convey that, right? And that would be specifically what she's doing. And that would be attention words, right? They're more specific to what the activity is. As to what he was might be doing, as to what he might be doing or what she. For both, for both of oh. them. So she's sneaking up on him. And then he's talking to someone else, right? Yeah, right. So clarifying both those things gives us a broader picture of what's really happening in that room. It's adding details, specific yeah. well, details. I, I, knowing, knowing the background of it, you know, where she would, she is a worker in the household, so it's okay for her to be there. And, uh, you know, okay. so, yeah. Okay. Very okay, good. good. So all those little details added, those are things that really help it. We start seeing more what the setting, that's like adding some of the setting. We see some of what the setting is, some of what, and the tension grows with that. Right, but so there have to be, of course, other, other paragraphs to go with that that would explain more, of course, you know, right. before that paragraph came, yeah. Okay. Thank Roxy, you. Roxy has her hand up. Uh, Roxy. Um, so I got a little bit of a feeling of kind of like a double negative from that in the sense that it started with there was never going to be a good time to tell him. So I'm expecting that she's going to tell him and then it goes back to she can't tell him now. I feel like it was switched a little bit to maybe the beginning opening with how much she wanted to tell him or how she'd finally worked up the courage then withholding being able to tell him now is not the time would feel a little stronger if that makes any sense. I think that, yeah, I think that's a good idea. That conflict within her. There's not going to be a good time, but yet she still wants to tell him, but now she can't tell him. Yeah. Good. Uh, Terry, I see your hand up. Um, yes. Ask um, whether or not he was speaking to a woman or a man, because I'm envisioning the library doors. Most libraries have 
well, most libraries have a glass door that you enter the library in. And so I'm wondering who he's talking to and if it's a woman or a man, because apparently she wants to tell him something, but she can't because, you know, and that would, you know, sort of create more tension in her as well as the story, if it were a woman. Yeah, well, he's a, he was a, he's a doctor, and so he could have been consulting with a patient. Oh, so this is okay. So this is a, a hospital setting. No, or, no, um, no, no. Yeah, this is so. It's Anna's, a home setting. <laughs> um, Annis has a good point here. What does she hear, or is it something about the tone of his voice or his words? That, she, that makes her realize she's going now. That's good. Okay. Tone of voice. Okay. And who and talking? Then, to you? Diane okay. said, is the door ajar or shut tight or partially open? So okay. that door can be almost a character in that moment. In that I scene. see. I see. Okay. Well, those are good points. I'll write those down. Okay. Thank you. Good job. Okay. <laughs> um, Let's see, Lillian. Yes, hi. Hi. Shall I go ahead and read it? Yes. The elevator stopped between the 10th and the 9th floors and the lights went off. The emergency button didn't work without electricity. Joe was caught in a wooden big box with plain metallic buttons and doors. I shouldn't have taken the service elevator. I didn't tell anyone where I'm heading. No one knows I'm here. If only there was an elevator operator like in the old days who sat on a stool and pushed the floor button for the customers. I hope the hotel management can help me out of here without any of my colleagues hearing about it. Okay. Comments. I, I love the visual of the reminder of the old um, elevators with the operators. Good, yeah, it is very visual. It also speaks to me of age, the age of the character that he would bring, that he, I'm assuming he remembers it because he was there or that was going on during his time. So to me, it says something about his age. Is that true? Uh, you're right, and I didn't take it that. No, he was in his 30s, but I didn't look at it that way. Okay, so that's one of the things, um, let's see. Well, okay, so you don't actually say that, so you're, he could be much younger. Um, because we do read about the old times, so right. we talk about the past. You're right. and. What you might add is how he came by that knowledge, you know, he'd read about, he read about or, it. or his father had told him about, or he'd seen in a movie, in an old movie, or, you know, something like that. Yeah. And that helps clarify he's not, but, but by the time we get to this point, we may already know his age and that yes. might not even be a question. Okay. Um, so we've, you put him in a situation where he he's trapped in, an, in a service elevator. Yes. He's gonna be embarrassed. Yes, exactly. Exactly, this is it. So- and He was a bit afraid. And a bit afraid. No one knows he, he took the elevator service, the service elevator. But it's the embarrassment part that's, that you got. Okay, so why is he embarrassed? He doesn't want his colleagues to hear about it because if they do, they are going to think, what an idiot. So it's interesting to me that he's worried about his colleagues, but not his life, say, a wife, yeah, or somebody personal. Yeah. He was in a hotel mm -hmm. on a flight abroad. So the context doesn't make him have to worry about anyone else except embarrassment in front of his colleagues if they got to know. So except that, except that uh, the embarrassment of being in this hotel 
uh, might, might be a point of tension for whatever reason he was in this hotel and for whatever reason he decided he needed to take service elevator instead of like the elevator where he could be seen. There's something about him being in the hotel that intrigues me. Mm, I can see that. Mm. Um, Terry. Yeah, I, um, I'm seeing him in a hotel uh, and when he talks about his colleagues, I'm thinking he's at a conference mm -hmm. at a hotel and that he doesn't want, and he's in the service elevator, which is usually where they bring up the food and all and the garbage and stuff like that. So I guess my two questions are, why does he take the service elevator? And two, if he's in a, at a conference, um, why didn't he use the regular elevator? because he doesn't want his, his colleagues to see him like this. So I don't know what he's done. I don't yeah. know where he's been, yeah. but it certainly raises a lot of reader interest. Yeah. So maybe some hints about that, Lillian. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. It's a good example of visual and it's a good example of uh, starting to build questions. And somebody started to say something I interrupted. I thought. Okay. Well, Thank good you. Talk, Lillian. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm thinking, Sandy, am I right that we've probably hit our time limit or? Um, you have about 15 minutes if you'd like to take them. Okay. Let's ask then, um, does anyone else have a paragraph they'd like to read? I don't see any hands. Okay. I don't does, see hands. Does anyone have any other um, writing questions they'd like to ask? Or you just, I can just talk about me. That's always <laughs> my favorite subject. <laughs> Are any of you writing about the pandemic? I sometimes write articles on hubpages.com, community of writers online. I did write, but the, they are not considered the green, evergreen topics. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So um, in this book that I'm writing uh, with the girl running through the forest and stuff, um, I am going to have flashbacks, but I'm not too sure, like I want, it's to explain her story. So, um, so pretty much what I have is I'm doing an introduction. I'm not calling a prologue. I've heard that not a lot of publishers like that or readers like it either. Um, but so I, so I'm just going to call it an introduction. And that's what I, that was the opening paragraph that I told you. Um, and then as it progresses, we learn more about her story. So what would your advice be for doing the flashbacks? I know you already said some stuff, but like in my case, because her story is so vague in the introduction and stuff how should I go about telling her story in the next few chapters and stuff? Okay, so this is what I think about flashbacks. A lot of times we write a lot of stuff to start a book or a novel or short story with. And actually what it is, is it's background information to get to the moment that's interesting. So what I, I try to do is I try to cut all that beginning background stuff and set it aside. And then I try to tell the story. So two things about story, you want to start it as close to the moment of, um, of the problem issue event as possible. And then you want to conclude it as in as tight a frame 
mm -hmm. as you possibly can. Now that's not all, doesn't fit for all stories, but that's the general rule. So you have all this background that you think is important. So as you go through the story, you find a little nugget here that you can drop in in your character's thoughts or in dialogue or in something else that happens that some, maybe somebody's talking about the character or whatever, referring to something. You just take the nuggets and fit them in as you can. Now, sometimes nuggets are very short and sometimes they might be more, but you don't want them to be so much more that the tension falls or that you lose the reader's interest. Now, there are some books that are written totally about this happened in the present, next chapter's the past, next chapter, you know, that's a different kind of style. If you're, if you're, th that's very stylistic if you're writing that way. So you, you want to think about where is the blood, think of all that background information that you need, the parts you need as reveals. Where can I best reveal this information that will um, work with the tension, that will help um, explain something, or that will ask a question? Okay. Put a question in the reader's mind or inform somebody. So you're constantly looking for the nuggets you can pull out and feed into your story. Okay. And okay, so yeah, that makes more sense. That makes more sense. I was I was trying to figure out what I, what way I wanted to go because I was also thinking well I could do it what you were talking about the you know the chapter being one chapter being in the present then back flashback chapter present but that seemed too much mm -hmm. for this because um, so the part that I told you mm -hmm. the the paragraph that I gave you is actually set in the past and the first chapter jumps to uh, a future time. So, so I want to put that paragraph is when something triggers her to remember it. Okay. Some fear or some running away event or some forest event triggers her to remember. Maybe the purpose of remembering is to express her fear or to express okay. her, her, um, um, whatever whatever it is that you want to get out of that uh-huh that's when you okay. okay so yeah this this story is pretty much about a girl who um her family was her dad was in the cartel and he get uh, something happens and uh the ringleader of this cartel kills off her family except for her she runs so, um, and then she goes into hiding and then everything goes on from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's pretty much what it is. Yeah. So do that instead of doing an intro, because readers, a lot, I read, I read, I open a book, I read the front cover, I read the side, I read the back, I open it, I read every page. I read the copyright page. So I read the prologues, right? A lot of people do not read prologues. They skip the prologue and go right to chapter one. So the same would be true for an introduction, right? Okay. But what you would put in an introduction, feed it into your story. Okay, so I'll just put it into chapter one, probably. Yeah, or some things might be better revealed at another time. Oh, okay. Or maybe I could even put that in as a flashback or something yeah okay so okay see, yeah just see how you can weave it you're weaving it in okay Thank nancy you so much. nancy um annis uh, had a question which i would like to know as well um what advice do you have for us poets regarding creating tension you know that's a good question what's the answer annis <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so I don't write a lot of poetry. So I don't know that I can give you a good answer to that. Um, I, I think it's word choice. It's um, 
subject matter. Uh, it's, um, you know, how, how you write what it, you know, the stanza and the, I'm, I can't, I don't even know the right terminology, but you know, where the pauses are, how you break the lines, you know, if you break the lines shorter, I think you're probably going to have a little more tension in the story, but what do you, what do the two of you say it is? I, um, I do a lot of free verse poetry and a lot of grief poetry. I was in the funeral industry for 40 years. Um, and I find that if you use uh, occasionally use short one or two word snippets in the middle of your wherever you're going, that that causes a tension or a break or something that draws the reader's eye. OK. Um, Nancy, I think what you said about using specific words also important. Mm -hmm. um, in the poetry workshops I've taken, that's one of the things that we're taught is to, to um, use specifics. So I think uh, with what you said regarding specifics and tension would be helpful here as well. Yeah, and there are some words, direct specific words, a lot of them are they you associate them with tension mm -hmm. i think yes yeah yes um terry i've taken a few poetry classes in order to enhance writing and so one of the things i learned is that in a poem every word counts and the, the poet needs to use every word to give the reader a visual and understanding um, so that the, the impact of the poem is, um, is the same as the impact of a novel or a short story. Mm -hmm. But I know that it's the choices of words that give the reader a larger vision, mm -hmm. if that helps. Mm -hmm. That's good, good. Um, I, there was another question here. Uh, can you discuss the difference between analogies, metaphors, and similes? I happen to have notes from my class Thursday night. I teach presentations and stories um, at uh, the business school. And we just went, slightly went over this. So uh, let me just tell you what I have here. So um, a metaphor is a figure of speech in which a word or phrase denoting one kind of object or action is used in place of another to suggest a likeness or analogy. And we, we looked at some of the metaphors here as people were talking, we shared them. Uh, a simile is explicit comparison, like it uses like or as. So a voice smooth as silk. Uh, my love is like a red, red rose. A love is a simile to, but if you say love is a rose, that's a metaphor. You're comparing what love, you're, you're comparing love and rose. But if you say it's like a red, red rose, then it's a simile. And then an analogy is a comparison of two otherwise unlike things based on resemblance of a particular aspect. So an apple and an orange, are different, but they're like because they're both fruit. So it's a, a comparison. Now, our poets probably study this more than I do. This always makes me a little nuts um, because metaphors, it's really, I mean, a metaphor is a really big, strong, overarching word. Um, It's a way of comparing, all three are a way of comparing things, either as being alike or as being different, as making um, two things, one thing represent something else. Was that really vague and general and unhelpful? <laughs> Well, um, Ellen Bass says that um, she calls all of those comparisons metaphor. 
uh, similes and metaphor, um, you know, your specific definition, she calls all of that metaphor and how the metaphor in a poem um, or any time, I guess, really brings the reader to the image that you're trying to get across. And, um, and the metaphor creation as well. So, um, yeah. yeah, metaphor and, and simile. That's great. And I see Isaiah has a, an ex uh, description here. Our similes are just a form of metaphor that uses like or as. Metaphor, she flew into the crowd, a hawk in search of its prey. So we're, we're comparing how she entered the crowd to a hawk in, in search. Um, a simile would say she flew into the crowd like a hawk in search of prey. So good examples. Okay, what are some of my favorite examples of characteristics, uh, characters that have made them distinct memorable? Um, Nancy, I think this should be the last question. That's okay. 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 Um, I like heroes. So we've been watching the Marvel movies. There's a timeline on, I don't remember if it's, I think it's the Disney Channel has a timeline because they own part of Marvel now or all of Marvel. I don't know what their rights are, but uh, so they have a timeline of the Marvel movies and we've been watching them in order. And I find the Marvel movies are so violent. And as my one of my daughters says, innocent people are always dying in Marvel movies. In DC movies, you have Wonder Woman and you have Superman who in Marvel movies, your characters are sort of the anti-heroes. They've fallen and yet they've got this heroic component to them that they step up when they're needed. But in the meantime, when they have them together, they're fighting, fighting, fighting about everything. In, um, in the DC heroes like Superman and Wonder Woman, Wonder, I don't know if you saw the Wonder Woman, the first movie, I haven't seen the next one, but. I mean, she doesn't care what everybody says. She's out to do what's right and what's honorable and what's good. And she cares about what happens to other people. And when they enter that war and all these people are suffering, no, no, we're not going on to the war. We're gonna take care of these people right now, right here. And we're gonna help them. Um, so I like honorable characters. I like characters who, would, who really achieve who really seek to be better than they are, do better than they are. And one of my favorite characters that I'm writing about is someone who really fell from grace, which is one of the things I complained about the Marvel characters, but um, he did a lot of good stuff, but he made some bad choices and now he's paying for it, but he's trying to do the right thing now. He's trying to live his life in a, in a, in a good place, an honorable place. And he's trying to overcome the areas he made mistakes. So I like characters, you know, for so long we've had the anti-hero and the anti-heroes, I, I see it all the time with my students, it makes me crazy. The anti-heroes who are just awful, awful people, but they, they do one good thing or they're, ever, they're, they're fighting against two evils and what the greater, the, the lesser evil be, will be on top. I don't like those kind of heroes. I, I like the heroes who strive to be good and do good. And even if they have a past, they're striving to overcome that past to do something better. I don't know if that helps. Um, yeah, th thanks Nancy. Is that, <laughs> is that what you wanted to know? Or <laughs> I, know I think the world is hungry. I think the world is getting, for so long we've been in postmodernism and it's all been so negative. And I think the world is growing hungry for good. But what'd you start to say? Yeah, um, I, I think that's, um, yeah, that, that's, an even, that's another big topic. I think um, there is um, a truth to that. Um, yeah, I mean, I was thinking more about um, kind of characteristics maybe kind of 
things like um, a character has, um, whether it's a, a, a way of speaking or some kind of tick or just something that um, distinguishes them from other characters. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about kind of, yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking about how to kind of make my- Un Unusual, um, give them something unusual that juxtaposes who we would think something different and unique about them that is unexpected that makes them interesting great yeah it's it's something that i'm um brainstorming but actually yeah that's that's um that is handy and useful thank you good good Nancy, we thank you so much for being here. And to all of our um, participants, thank you for all of your good input and sharing your stuff. Um, Cynthia, do you have any final words before we before we let all of our nice folks go? Uh, I just wanted to um, tell Nancy, thank you very much. It was a wonderful workshop. <laughs> and thank you uh, um, to our participants. Um, for um you know coming to the discussion and adding to it <laughs> i think it was a great great workshop and i it's always so much more fun when people participate and i mm. want to be involved well thank you all and we hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day stay cool wherever you are and drink lots of water <laughs> <laughs> bye take care